An 18 year veteran of the San Diego Police Department has been charged with felony stalking and extortion of his ex girlfriend. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Carlo Chiquetto. I'm Marcella Lee and for Barbara Lee Edwards. As News 8's David Godfordson reports, the police sergeant is accused of texting nude photos of the woman, stalking her at work, and using police databases to get personal information on her new boyfriend. Veteran San Diego Police Sergeant Marius Zaz arrested Wednesday morning, taken into custody to the downtown jail. Real estate records show he lives in University City, and during the course of a seven-month investigation, officers served a search warrant on his house. Zaz is accused of stalking, extortion, false imprisonment, making harassing phone calls, disobeying a restraining order, and destroying evidence. News 8 interviewed him on camera back in 2019 at the scene of a fake pedestrian hit and run. That evening she hit something in the roadway and she believed it was the pedestrian that was killed. Sergeant Zaz had been assigned to desk duty at the San Diego Police Department while officers investigated complaints made against him by his former girlfriend. In her application for a restraining order last year, the woman says Zaz hacked her cell phone and started sending her text messages with naked photos taken from her phone. The sender stated they would release information and nude photos slash videos of the girlfriend if she did not pay them money. And the message included a screenshot of her partial contact list and a topless photo of the girlfriend that she stored on her phone. The woman reported to Carlsbad Police Sergeant Zaz stalked her at a private home where she works with autistic children. Investigators also found out that Sergeant Zaz had used a San Diego Police database to run the license plate of the woman's new boyfriend and to get the new boyfriend's personal information and address according to her restraining order affidavit. The court records also say Zaz conducted a traffic stop on the woman in May of last year and asked her why she was leaving him. Prior to this girlfriend, the sergeant was married for 22 years. He filed for a divorce in 2019, and he has two young twin children with his ex-wife. Carlo? David, does the officer have a lawyer at this point, and when is he going to appear in court? Well, he does not have a lawyer yet. He was just arrested this morning, and we know there are two sides to every story, and his side of the story will come out once he starts making court appearances. He was set to be arraigned next week, but I just checked the jail uh, website, and it looks like he has bailed out, so that will delay his arraignment under the current COVID rules. More to come. David Garperson reporting live. Thanks, David. A man accused of killing a beloved Cathedral Catholic High School teacher and football coach faced a judge for the first time today. 30-year-old Jesse Alvarez faces a murder charge in the death of Mario Fierro. He pleaded not guilty. News 8's Alicia Summers has more from the Hall of Justice downtown. The defendant remained emotionless today as his ex-girlfriend, who's also his alleged victim's fiance, wrote a letter that was read out loud by a prosecutor. I stand before you a woman who has lived in fear of the defendant, Jesse Alvarez, for over a year. But above all, I stand before you a grief-stricken and heartbroken over the violent murder of my beloved fiance, Mario Fierro, the true love of my life at the hands of the defendant. The prosecution in a murder case reads out loud a statement written by the defendant, Jesse Milton Alvarez's ex-girlfriend. Jesse Alvarez is a danger to me and to society. I fear for my life, our family, our friends, our students, and our co-workers' lives. She was the fiance of Cathedral Catholic High School teacher and football coach Mario Fierro. The 30-year-old defendant is accused of killing 37-year-old Fierro. In court, prosecutors said Alvarez drove to Fierro's residence in North Park on February 1st, dressed in all black, armed with a semi-automatic, and waited for Mr. Fierro to walk outside. He then approached Mr. Fierro and shot him multiple times, executing him. Prosecutors also said that after the defendant's ex-girlfriend broke up with him, she filed a restraining order against Alvarez a year ago due to stalking and suicidal threats, but the court denied her request back then. I stand before you a victim of the court 
when I sought it to protect me in January of 2020 and my cries of help for a restraining order against the defendant, Jesse Alvarez, was wrongfully denied. Meanwhile, the defense painted the defendant as a college-educated man with no criminal record. In his adult life, he has maintained steady employment. Um, he has lived entirely in the state of California um, and has, again, maintained very good ties to the community, both his church, family, and friends as well. The defense asked the judge to set bail at $1.5 million, but the judge says if Alvarez posted bail, he could be a threat to society. So that bail was denied, and he remains in jail without bail. His bail hearing is set for next Friday. Back to you. All right, Alicia, thanks. We now know the name of the woman whose body was found in Lake Murray. 44-year-old Elena Lasowski was discovered in the water on Sunday. So far, no word on a cause of death, and there were no known reports of a missing person matching her description. According to the medical examiner's office, Lasowski lived here in San Diego. Donald Trump surrendered his role as commander-in-chief and became the inciter in chief. House Democrats wrapped up a full second day of arguments at the historic second impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. Today, House managers presented a series of dramatic videos to demonstrate a timeline of the deadly January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. They're trying to make their case that the former president incited the riots by his supporters. Natalie Brand reports tonight from the Capitol. House managers are spending the day of the Senate impeachment trial laying out their case that former President Trump directly incited the January 6th Capitol attack. In this new security video, you can see the mob attacking officers with a crutch, a hockey stick, a bullhorn. To make the case, House managers used never-before-seen video, including footage from U.S. Capitol security cameras to help illustrate the extent of the assault. Officer Goodman passes Senator Mitt Romney and directs him to turn around in order to get to safety. The left lies, they cheat and they steal. House managers also argued that the former president's words and actions prior to that day primed rioters to travel to Washington on January 6th. Donald Trump surrendered his role as commander in chief and became the inciter in chief. House managers will have up to two days for their arguments. Then on Friday, the clock starts for the president's legal team, who will also have up to 16 hours for their case. One of the former president's top Senate allies, Lindsey Graham, says he spoke to Mr. Trump after his defense attorney's presentation on Tuesday was widely criticized. Senator Graham said he told the president, quote, the case is over. It's just a matter of getting a final verdict down. The managers made just an overwhelmingly compelling case. The evidence that has been presented thus far is pretty damning. Assuming that all Senate Democrats and independents vote to convict, House managers would have to convince at least 17 Republicans to join them. On Capitol Hill, I'm Natalie Brand for News 8. San Diego's case rate is making big declines after a holiday spike, and we are getting a lot of questions on when we might start to see more businesses reopen. News 8's Brandon Lewis takes us beyond the numbers tonight for a look at what could be ahead. Now, Carlo and Marcelo, the last time that we were in the red tier was back in November 1st. That ended about two months of a small glimmer of normalcy. Now, that's on the horizon again, but we do want to set your expectations that it's likely several months out. More than three months ago, scenes like these weren't unusual. People dining socially distanced indoors or working out inside. But that changed in November when we moved into the purple tier, setting the stage for a bleak winter that packed ICUs and sent our case rate rocketing. On November 2nd, our adjusted rate was a 7.4. It peaked at nearly 70 January 11th and is now at about 34. We need it to get below 25 to reopen elementary schools, to reopen others and to move into the red tier, we need a rate of at least 7.0 or lower and stay there for at least three weeks. That likely means we're talking about mid-March or April to partially reopen indoor dining, gyms, museums and theaters. The biggest hurdle is we've never really done well in red tier. Yes, we were there for two months, but there were a lot of data issues last fall and we kept getting exemptions because we were doing a lot of testing. This time around, we have the vaccine, which could help keep our rate low if we can get enough supply. 
Right now, county sites are running at about 60% capacity, so there are a lot of variables and a long road ahead before we can start thinking about the red tier. And one thing to watch in the next few weeks and months are these new variants that are popping up because they are more contagious and they could potentially set us back. But the biggest takeaway is that we are still several months away from likely getting into the red tier. Carlo and Marcella. All right, Brandon, thanks. New COVID-19 cases are under 1,000 for a third straight day today. County health officials are reporting 810 new cases, and that is about 4% of more than 19,000 tests. That is pretty low. The two-week positivity rate has now dropped to 6.5%, and COVID-related hospitalizations are below 1,000 for the first time in two months. 51 new deaths were reported today, bringing that total to 2,904, at least the trend seems to be looking in the right direction. So far, we'll see what happens with Super Bowl weekend and these new variants. Got to keep at it. Mask up, socially distance, wash your hands, do all of it. Two masks. The San Diegans turned out to help save a life today for day one of Kyle Kraska's Celebrations of Heroes Blood Drive. It also marks six years to the day that Kyle survived a shooting right outside his house. He started the blood drive to help address the critical need here in San Diego and as a way to say thank you to the medical heroes who saved his life. And as a thank you to Kyle, the American Red Cross recognized his effort during the pandemic, saying it has impacted more than 2,600 lives and has brought in nearly 900 units of blood. Okay, if you missed your opportunity today, there's still a chance to donate tomorrow. You can make your appointment now at cbs8.com heroes.